full preterism is the idea all biblical prophecy concerning the judgment, coming of the Lord, resurrection, the new creation were fulfilled. Well, all right. So I'm very excited, everyone, because today I have my good friend. I'm calling him a good friend right now. I'm already calling him a good friend, <laughs> even though today's the first day he's met me kind of sort of through the screen. Uh, and brother, brother Don Preston. How are you, my good brother? I am very, very well. Thank you so much. I can't I can't explain how excited I am to have you because I've been doing a revelation series and um and I've been taking the historical view of the book of Revelation and as we briefly spoke earlier off of the recording I was explaining to you how um I thought I might be alone on this until uh, <laughs> uh you know 4 6 8 weeks ago uh maybe a little bit further back where I started going on to as you mentioned Mr Google and I found out there was you my good friend and brother that had already been working on this position this historical view where essentially uh it's called either covenant eschatology or full preterism where we take the point of view that the new testament is is essentially documenting for us the completion from jesus's birth to the destruction of israel jerusalem and the temple ushering in the new covenant and that spiritual kingdom that does not come with observation. It was established in the first century and therefore all things be fulfilled in our scriptures. And this is a rare position compared to a lot of the futurist eschatology. And I, I find you to be very, very thorough in your studies. And that's why I have you on today. So why, why don't you do me a favor from your point of view, ex explain uh, you know briefly what full preterism is be glad to uh, preterism or the word preterist is from a latin word protero meaning past and so full preterism is the idea that by the by the time of and in the events of the fall of jerusalem in the old uh, uh in the uh, destruction of jerusalem in AD 70 all biblical prophecy concerning the judgment coming of the lord resurrection the new creation etc cetera, etc cetera, were fulfilled and that, what that means is that the old covenant is no longer in effect, that, but that Christians today live in what is known as the new heaven and the new earth. Now, we need, we'll need to discuss all of that as we progress because most people have the idea, well, new heaven and new earth. Wait a minute, Preston, I look out the window and I see the same old trees and rocks and birds and bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes that I'm used to seeing. So uh, same old, same old, same old. But that's not the kind of creation that God was talking about or promising. He was promising a new covenant creation. And I'll just say this one word further. All futurist eschatologies can be called historical eschatologies. That is, they all teach the end of human history. That is not a biblical doctrine. The biblical doctrine is the only, quote, world that was to end was the old covenant world of old covenant Israel to, to, to usher in the new covenant world of Jesus Christ, which is unending, has no end. So you have historical eschatology versus covenant eschatology. And so, so when you see um, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, which I've harped on quite a bit myself, it literally says the many ages to come. Sorry, I'm paraphrasing a pinch, but then he says, world without end, amen. And so what are we going to do with world without end if we continue to teach people that there is an end of the world when that comes flying in the face of what <laughs> our good brother Paul wrote approximately almost 2,000 years ago? And yet, um, and you know, I have to say, uh, me and my good brother Dominic here, who handles the techie stuff here, I was we were just talking in the kitchen a little while ago, and I said, you know, every single eschatology, all, you know, is predicting futurism. Even those who... Um, a claim that they don't get involved. You know, we don't listen. I don't study very much of eschatology. We're just waiting on the Lord to return. I go, ah, you're a futurist. <laughs> yep. And they go, what do you mean? I go, well, you said Jesus has to return. What, do, he gotta, he's got to return for something, right? Well, of course, at the end of the world, I go, see, you're a futurist. You're a futurist. Whether you, whether you admit it or not. And you're suggesting in that form of eschatology, which is every other form of eschatology, including partial preterism, 
<laughs> and including what I call a group called the Little Season Group. They all have that same position that something has yet to happen in the future, bringing about most of the time, I think, the resurrection and the end of the world as in, in you know, complete annihilation of the world. And as, as you were mentioning, new heaven and new earth, meaning a physical new heaven as if God's heaven apparently needs repair and, uh, <laughs> and, and a new earth like there's something wrong with the earth itself, whereas we're saying saying, no, no, this has nothing to do with a, you know, new throne room and a renovation in that regard. It's a renovation in the, um, in the covenantal sense. All right. So, so, okay. So I'm in the zone. Right. Okay, great. So we've explained what full preterism is. And let me ask you something that, uh, my lovely wife wanted me to ask you, what's, what was the switch? Like, what was the big light switch for you that made you go from let's say, what was your most recent position in eschatology prior to full preterism? Was it partial preterism? Was it uh, millennial? What was it prior to full preterism, if you will, in covenant eschatology? I, w- I was raised as a fifth generation member of the millennial view. Uh, millennialism says there is no millennial reign. Uh, the Christian age is the millennium and what have you. Uh, I actually defended that position in, for, in formal public debate. Uh, unfortunately, for, Unfortunately for me, if you want to put it like that, during my preparation for that debate, I started running. I had been running into problems already with my traditional view. And uh, (laughs) I got up during one night of the debate. It was a four-night formal public debate. And I said, look, the following passages are troublesome for my opponent in, in this debate. But let me say something. They're also troubling for the traditional view of the churches of Christ. Boy, and that's I who you worked gonna, for, right? That's huh? who you worked for. You were you you were part of the Churches of Christ. Yes, I was part of okay. the Churches of Christ, and I can tell you right now, <clears throat> I thought I was going to get stoned by my own brethren that night <laughs> you know, for suggesting that we had any problem with our eschatology. But uh, I, I mean, you know, it's what I was taught. My father himself was very very uncertain about eschatology, as I shared with you off air. And so, you know, this was one of those things that um, I, when I began to see all of the time statements of Scripture about, behold, I come quickly, some standing here shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I mean, we've got to deal with these texts. And we, can't, we cannot sweep them aside by saying, oh, well, one day is with the Lord a thousand years. Uh, folks who appeal to that very often fail to see, well, a thousand years is like a day. <laughs> the, the, the pendulum swings both ways. The so I pendulum could argue, swings both, yeah. uh, both so, ways on so, this. So we could argue that a thousand years, a thousand year reign of Jesus will just be Tuesday. Exactly. That's <laughs> precisely correct. Right, right. Uh, but, but of course, they don't want to do that. And, and so people like say, well, God doesn't think in time like we do. Well, I, what I did, now this was before the days of the computer and electronic Bible study, okay? I had my good old Strong's Unabridged Concordance, you know, the book that's this thick. I I went through literally every single passage in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, in which the words soon, quickly, shortly, at hand were used along with the corollary and the antonyms of not at hand, not soon, not shortly. And it became more than apparent to me. <clears throat> it's not even, in my estimation, I don't certainly don't want to come across as harsh on this, <clears throat> but it became apparent to me that there's no way to properly at all, honestly, deal with all of the evidence and not admit that God can tell time perfectly well. I mean, the Daniel prophecies are, are based on perfect time statements. Accurate time statements. <laughs> Indeed. Right. And then he tells Daniel, but Daniel, seal up the book because it's not going to be for essentially 490 years, shall we say? Yeah. Right. And then and then he tells John, hey, John, open up the book because the time is at hand. It, yeah. But, and it's been 2000? That, 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 <laughs> that very contrast that you're mentioning there between Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 2 is one of those studies that rocked my world. Because I I tried for a little while, Uh, you know, I mentioned to you uh, off air, I came kicking and screaming to where I am right now. Uh, And the reason for that was I knew that if I took a position contrary uh, to the tradition of my my fellowship, 
Uh, I'd be out on the street. Uh, as I have said many, many times, we shoot our wounded. And anybody that takes a, a divergent position than the tradition, they're wounded. So you just shoot them. You, you don't try to change them. When I started, when I started finding all of these difficulties with the traditional view, I would go to my preaching peers, my buddies, my friends, I thought, and say, look, man, you got to help me out here. Here's what I'm seeing. And I got people literally telling me, I don't want to talk to you, Don. Um, I know exactly what you're saying, but you've got to be careful. Now, I'm, I'm just sharing with you what some of those friends said to me, not, this is not to pat myself on the back, but many of them said, boy, you know, Don, you're, you're a rising star in the church. You've, you've got a really great future ahead of you. If you keep this up, you're going to lose your position. And I go, what are you talking about position? I'm talking about the truth of God. We, we, what are we more concerned about here? Well, you know exactly what I'm talking about, so you be, you just better watch it. So, now, if you don't mind me asking, how much of this do you think has to do with these kind of, you know, and let's face it, they are outside of Scripture, the creedal um, uh, obligations that these folks seem to be using as part of their um, argument, to which I kind of say, well, you know, well, maybe then th you're not really using Scripture, though. <laughs> right. So to which I go, okay, but you know, so, and, and you're kind of coming against. So for example, it talks about how Jesus will come back. He shall come mm -hmm. back. We believe he shall come back to resurrect the living and the dead. And you're saying, well, Matthew 13, he's saying at the end of the age, the resurrection is going to happen. And the age that he was in was the Mosaic age under the law mm -hmm. of Moses. So the resurrection was going to happen at the end of the Mosaic age, ushering in the new covenant age. And that, and he says, all things will be fulfilled within this generation generation and you have mm -hmm. Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2 clearly talking about a resurrection and so if everything that is written must be fulfilled that would have to include the resurrection but the creeds say that that's not quite accurate so how much of that do you think kind of um, keeps some of these folks that that might even agree with you I, I'll call them potential closet full <laughs> preterists well that's very accurate and th the allegiance to the creeds and, and the power of tradition without any question whatsoever, prevents a lot of people from accepting the truth of covenant eschatology. I cannot tell you the number of times I have been contacted by people privately. I've studied with them. They've read some of my books. Uh, I have, you know, I have three websites. The main one is donkpreston.com. Literally thousands of articles on the website, free for anyone to read, to download, et cetera, et cetera. And they've told me, I've read the material, I believe what you're saying, but the creeds don't teach it, so I can't accept it. And it's like, wait a minute. And most of these come from the Reformed background, um, the Calvinistic perspective. Well, as I have pointed out to many of these individuals who are so deeply troubled, and they see the truth of Scripture, but they cannot, they can't go all the way, so to speak, because of the creeds, and I pointed out to them, well, the Westminster Confession of Faith itself says the creeds have been wrong many times, but the Scripture is the sole, ultimate, and final authority, no matter what the creeds say. Now, that's obviously a rough paraphrase, but that's the point of the creed of the Westminster Confession of Faith. So, if you see that Scripture contradicts the Westminster Confession of Faith, then if you want to if you want to follow the Westminster Confession of Faith, you will reject it and accept what the Scripture says. Priority. Because, I mean, that's what the Westminster Confession of Faith says. Creeds have been wrong. Creeds can be wrong. Scripture is the final authority. Follow the Scriptures. But listen, many of the most prominent anti-preterist spokesmen today, men such as Kenneth Gentry and Ken and I have been on the same diet speaking before. Uh, he's a he's an amiable type of person, very cordial in person. I like the guy. He refuses absolutely to debate me. Uh, he's been challenged no less than 15, perhaps even 20 times, not only by me, but a number of people that are close to him to meet me in formal public debate. He refuses to do so. So what is, what is Kenneth Gentry's main court of appeal? Well, he just recently wrote an article, The Historical Error of Full Preterism. What does he do in the article? 
and it's posted on academia.edu, uh, Kenneth Gentry appeals to the creeds. It's not an article saying, now here's what the Bible says, folks. It is, boy, look. Look at what the creeds say. Look at what the patristic writers say. Well, I believe that we can honor and we can certainly respect the scholarship of many of the men who put together the creeds. We can honor and respect the patristic writers because they lived a long time ago. However, anyone who's done any study at all of the patristic writers know there was no there was no unanimity among them. And somebody says, well, they all believed in, in the future coming of the Lord. Well, that's true. I, I, would, I would certainly say that. But it may be one of the very, very, very few things on which they were agreed. Many of the things that the, that the creedal, or excuse me, that the patristic writers believed in would be, would be considered heretical these days. Many of the ancient patristic writers were just downright weirdos. Let's just, fo- I, I call them Fruit Loops. <laughs> and they were. I mean, I'm telling you right now, uh, when, I, when people have thrown up the patristic writers to me I, i've just asked him i said well okay um so you're telling me that you think that we we've got to follow the patristic oh yeah absolutely they lived the closest to the time of jesus and the apostles well that's true they did uh, so i asked them uh, are you as a married individual going to lead a celibate life well no i love my wife we have a healthy relationship. Oh, well, no, no, no. You don't You don't understand. <laughs> Justin the Martyr, one of the high, most highly respected of the patristics, said as Christians, as faithful Christians, we abstain from all conjugal relations because, after all, that's to be pleasurable. And therefore, as Christians, we must abstain. Well, he's out of his mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's what you what you're basically saying is is like look, we can respect, we can review just like any document, uh, you know, Luther, um I, I, we can read anything from history, but just like we are, they were human. And we have to keep in mind too my, these creeds at least that they're talking to us about were primarily if I recall correctly, I mean, they're three, 300 plus years after Right, the destruction of Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple, and I, I have to say, how long does it really take, uh, let's say, people to forget something or misinterpret <laughs> something? Well, I, I would argue probably less than a hundred years is required for because I mean, let's face it, right? Like my, if my grandfather was around, he'd he'd be going, what what are you what are you people doing? Yeah. <laughs> right, oh, because absolutely. he'd forgotten so much about things that he had gone through and some of the lessons that he would carry forward, and and so that's only like a couple generations ago. So, can they be wrong in establishing? And also, the purpose behind the creed does kind of worry me because it seems, best as I know, to be a response to some heresy that was going on. But but when do creeds prevent heresy? Because we got creeds now, and I hear the word heresy. All the time. Hey, yeah. sometimes it's used for me and you, Don. <laughs> well, <laughs> right? I, I hear I, I hear the word heresy thrown at me almost on a daily basis, to be honest about it. Uh, sometimes several times a day. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and and I, I respond to people in the following way. Well, how are you using the word heresy? I know how they're using it, but sometimes you have to point out to them. The word heresy simply means out of step. Uh, and I freely admit that I'm not in step with the creeds. I'm not in step with church history, but I do not believe that I'm, that I'm out of step with the biblical uh, narrative. And that's the key thing with me. You know, and the 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 big you know the big thing. And again, I'm going to say this right now, just in case whoever's listening, I'm not I'm not a prophet, but I can I can use a little bit of discernment to say, you know, as time goes on, there's because there are certain um, eschatologies, certainly dispensationalism, that really hangs their hat on the idea that when Israel became a nation in 1948, that's, that's you know, that's Jesus saying, see that generation, and that's how we got those books, you know, 88 reasons to believe Jesus is oh, coming yeah. back, you know, all that, right? That's And clearly they're wrong. 
right? They're clearly wrong uh, because it didn't happen. We all know this. And now that 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 timeline is is stretching. So they're stretching what a generation means. Well, there's going to be a point, for example, with that eschatology, that that elastic's going to break. And I'm going to suggest, and I'm only suggesting, that one of the reasons why I think that this eschatology is starting to gain momentum, and it is, by the way, mm-hmm. it is, even quietly and a little bit loudly, <laughs> is because because that that doesn't fit. It doesn't work. He said, this generation shall not pass away before all these things be fulfilled. And the whole context was not the end of the entire earth being annihilated. The context was the temple. And it was indeed destroyed in 70 AD. We know that factually, right? Historically, we know that. So therefore, the temple destruction, that generation, he was speaking in and around 30 AD, 70 AD. Remember that whole 1948 plus 40 is 1988? I've yep. argued many times. I go, hey, the math, the math is fantastic. Your absolutely. eschatology's yeah. wrong. <laughs> it's yeah. like it's not we, we we totally get 1948 plus 40 is 1988. It's your eschatology that's wrong. It's not your math. Your math is wonderful. You did a fine yeah, job. That's right. But but you're in the wrong era. That's what you're doing wrong. And so, um, but of course, I have to say, so basically, if you don't mind me kind of surmising this, that we're saying, look, the time statements, what Jesus said about this generation, everything points to the promise that was made of a new covenant. We we believe there was four beast kingdoms that Daniel talks about, right? And we know them to be from Daniel's time on. And please do, Don, you're here. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm correct, it's Babylon, then Medo-Persian, then Grecia, then Roman Empire. Amen. Then the spiritual kingdom, there it is, that never ends because it's a spiritual kingdom and it can never be broken. It can never be busted up. And it's the kingdom that does not come with carnal eyes and does not come with observation. You can't say low here, low there. Hey, Don, let's get on a plane and go to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> right? We can't do that. He And Jesus makes that very, very clear. So our position is he's fulfilled all. All those things seated at the right hand of the Father. And therefore, we get to look at the scriptures with great, great wonder, awe, and amazement and say, wow, God sent his son and did a short work on the earth, banged it out of the park, dare I use the term, (laughs) in a short work, right, batting a thousand, (laughs) a thousand, batting a thousand, and getting it all finished up so that mankind has um, a, a reconciler, if you will, through Christ to the Father. So that's the position. And I think it's certainly worthy of uh, checking out. And we will be supplying, by the way, everybody's checking this out. We're going to be supplying links to uh, Don's material uh, because I, I kind of joked earlier on. I said, you know, um, I was thinking about writing a book, but then I found out Don did all the work already. So, <laughs> hey, I'm just going to point you to to uh, my good friend and brother, Don Preston. So we're going to supply that in the description box. Um, in the meantime, though, of course, because people have heard futurism in every other form of eschatology. Every other one is awaiting the end of the world kind of a scenario, Armageddon with Will Smith and and Bruce Willis. And that's that's the scenario they paint, right? That there's just going to be some big, huge explosion, if you will. But that comes, they've learned that. So they kind of have to say, okay, well, wait a minute. Let's, let, we got to unlearn that. But then that comes with questions. So I'm going to just fire out some questions if you're okay with that. And, um, you know, maybe you can offer some suggestions as to um, you know how we reconcile those positions. So one, for example, is, and it's pretty simple. This one is okay. Well, if that's true, what happens to the believer today when when they pass on? Like, and and is is there still a judgment? And uh, you know, should what should the Christian do today? That kind of zone. What 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 do you got for uh, for the folks listening? That's one of the most common questions I, I believe that I am I am asked, and I, I would I would point out that. In my estimation, part of Christianity, uh, and even in all of the futurist views, <clears throat> they have piecemealed the story together. They've got part of it right, and then they've gotten a whole lot of it wrong. And number one, there is a false expectation that at the coming of the Lord, there would no, there would literally be absolutely no more evil anywhere. So they run to Revelation chapter 21, that in the new Jerusalem, there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain, there is no more death, there is no more curse. What they fail to 
realize is they're taking that in a universalistic and woodenly literalistic manner instead of keeping it within the covenant context in which it was given. But I want to share a passage with you that, and I, 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 for some reason or other, I don't know why, but you know, some verses, um, I've always kind of prided myself on being able to memorize scripture. Well, there are, there are a few verses that for some reason or other, they just don't get fully in there. So I'm going to read it from the good old King James translation, Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And again, this is King James translation, knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Now, <clears throat> notice he's anticipating the day. Every commentator that I'm aware of says that's the day of the Lord. That's Christ's parousia. Let me make a couple of real quick textual observations here. Knowing the time, the word time there is from the Greek word kairos. That is the appointed, divinely appointed, designated time. Okay, what time was designated? Well, well, I don't know. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31, Paul standing on Mars Hill says, God has appointed a day in which he is about to judge the world in righteousness. And when you say a bow to, it's because the word is mellow. Exactly right. M-E-L-L-O, <laughs> which exactly. oftentimes our, our translations will say shall, but it's mm-hmm. really not the best translation. It's actually about to. So please, exactly. back to you. Yeah. There's, a, there's a new translation. <clears throat> uh Well, it's over there (laughs) Uh, among my piles. I've showed Uh, showed that word several times in my revelation teachings that refer to a lot of these things that that mellow is, in fact, that word was used when King Herod was about to try to kill baby Jesus, right? That was the word. Now, was that fairly immediate? Yes, it was. See the difference between shall maybe one day. No, no. He was about to come to destroy the child. Okay. Well, there's this new translation by David Bentley Hart. Now, David Bentley Hart is a world-class Greek scholar. He is widely recognized in all academia as just a fantastic Greek scholar. He renders this in, or renders the word mellow in these eschatological texts, Acts chapter 24. I believe all things that are written in the law and the prophets, that there is about to be the resurrection of the just and the unjust, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when you've got world-class scholars like that, who are not preterists, by the way, they don't have a bone, eschatological bone to pick, but they realize that mellow means about to be. So anyway, knowing the time that now, that's the Greek word noon, and that means Paul's right now. Now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Well, wait a minute. That's a reference back to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the, du- who sleep in the dust of the earth shall arise, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and condemnation. So we are dealing here with a resurrection parousia text. And Paul said, notice what he says, knowing the time. Well, wait a minute. Jesus said, but of that day and hour knows no man. No, not the angels, but the Father only. But he also said, and this is critical, people people jump all over Matthew chapter 24 and say, oh, well, look, you know, verse 33, but of that day and hour knows no man. Wait a minute. Jesus also said in verse 32 of that very same chapter, he said, when you see all of these things, what things? The signs. The signs. When you see all these things, then know that it or he is near Greek word, ingus, even at the door. So Jesus said, okay, when you see the signs that I've just given you, the signs of the end, when you see the signs, you will know what time it is. Here's Paul. And by the way, one of the signs was the completion of the world mission. Paul in Romans chapter 1, Paul in Romans 16, 25 and 26 says the commission had been fulfilled. When he was yeah, writing, he says that in Colossians 1, 5 and 6 and Colossians 1, 23, that every creature under heaven, right? right had heard, heard the gospel, heard the gospel. So here is Jesus affirming, no man knows the day and the hour, but also saying, when you see the signs, you will know what time it is. And here's right. Paul who knew the signs saying, 
and who said the signs were present, said, you know what time it is, folks. How, here's my question. How do we ignore statements like this? When right. Paul says, you know what time it is. You know it is time. It's the, de- the time, literally. You know what the time is. And you know it's high time to wake out of sleep because, in other words, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 is about to be fulfilled. But that's not even the point I want to get to. I want to get to the point of your question was, where are we now? What, what do we do now? What, what's the church supposed to be doing now? Well, I believe historically the church has understood its mission. They've not understood the context of that mission. Okay? Let me right. explain that in a moment. Okay, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Well, at hand is in Guderon. Has drawn very near. Okay. Right. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Now watch the terminology very carefully. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Well, he just said the day is at hand. What Paul is saying here is the day hasn't arrived, but it's so near that you ought to start, you ought to be living lives of holiness, righteousness, justice, love, mercy, holiness, as if the day had already come, because when the day comes, that's how you're supposed to live. Right. In other words, he's describing the post parousia world. Right. And in that post parousia world, the things that he's describing here, and this is what I mean when the church historically has gotten something right, but they've got the context wrong. They're saying, oh, well, you know, after the day of the Lord, we don't have these all of these ethical mandates because there is no wickedness, there is no unrighteousness, there is no this, there is no unholiness to put off. Well, wait a minute. Paul said, when the day comes, you're supposed to be living now like you're going to live then. Well, how do you mean that, Paul? You're going to put off the works of darkness. You're going to be righteous. You're going to be holy. So what Paul, let me reiterate this. What Paul is defining and describing here is the post parousia world, the world in which we are living, in which we are supposed to be, as Christians, the true light to the world. And yet I see people, I know people who claim to be Christians. I'm not going to mention any names by any means. I once knew, I do, I still know him, we're not close. I once knew that uh, of a man who believed, well, you know, God's grace allows me to the go, go to the bar and get drunk and pick up a hooker if I want to, but that's so that they'll accept me as one of their brothers and let me preach the gospel to them. I go, well, let me see. Shall we sin that God, that grace might abound? God forbid. Is, is Jesus Christ a minister of sin? Right. I, I would just, uh, and I, I accosted him over it. I said, that's not the doctrine of grace. That is an abuse of God's grace. Now, he's, I'm glad to say, he's changed his attitude. Good, good. That's good news. He knows, he knows you don't go to a bar and get drunk with guys, and, and that makes them feel welcome to, for you to preach to them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're 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 shining the same dark light upon them that they're shining upon you. Is exactly. What's going on there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. Paul said in Ephesians chapter five, uh, thirteen to fifteen, have no fellowship with the works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And yet this guy was going, doing. I mean, he was doing everything that any branch of Christianity, any branch of conservative Christianity, would say that's sin, that's an abomination. It's a violation of the heart and the mind of God. It's unholy. And yet he was saying, oh, I'm free to do this, you know. Well, again, praise the Lord, he changed his mind. He no, no longer does those things, no longer believes those things. He knows he made him a horrible, horrible mistake. And so, you know, uh, what I want to emphasize in response to your question is, Paul was preparing people and something that we do not realize as much today because we live in so much better of a world that's been conditioned by Christianity. What we fail to realize today that in the Roman world to which he's writing, murder was an every single day event. Do you And same at Corinth. Paul said, you know, do you not know 
that adultery, fornication, homosexuality, murderers, thieves, extortioners, etc., shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, and such were some of you. Wait a minute, Paul, you said some of those dudes were Christians? Uh, I mean, <laughs> some of those Christians used to be murderers, thieves, etc., etc. He said, yeah, I know. Because that they lived in such a horrific, violent, inju- unjust world. Part of the worship that they involved were involved in with Aphrodite, Dionysus, what have you. These were sexual religions. The way that you worshipped in those religions was through debauchery, drunkenness, revelry. And so we failed to grasp, I dare say, how radical the gospel message was. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. By the way, a, a scholar by the name of Michael Green wrote a book entitled Evangelism in the New Testament. I highly recommend the book. I don't recommend, I mean, not every single thing he said I believe in, obviously, but that's okay. It is a fantastic book because he talks about the very thing that I'm talking about here of how unbelievably corrupt, immoral, debauched the ancient world was. And he makes a comment in the book that has stuck with me down through the years. Men, uh, God did not forsake man because man was so corrupt. In the first century, men forsook the gods because the gods were so corrupt. Mm, wow. You think, yeah, you think about that. And, the, and when, you be, when you study the ancient Roman pantheon, which, of course, they got from the Greeks and, re, and the Egyptians, and they renamed a bunch of the gods and goddesses, but it was all the same cultic practices, and it, again, it, it involved debauchery of the worst sort. And so when Paul went into these cities and preached righteousness, purity, holiness, Michael Green in the book says, one of the reasons that we read about so many women accepting the gospel so gladly is because women in the first century were such objects of debasement. Right. Sure. You talk about being glad of a message that says holiness is the way for you to live, you know, and, and, and being and, 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 a, and a doctrine that says, hey, husbands, love your wife the way Christ loved the church. You know, exactly. they, they, what, what, and, and anybody who does not provide for his own his own household is worse than an unbeliever. Like now that's the kind of doctrine. If I was a woman in the first century, I'd be like, yeah, I'm all over this doctrine. You know, and, and just that's think good about, news. Just think about how revolutionary. Paul's teaching was, and I've said this very, very often. I I have preached this. I will never forget this. I have a very good friend. He's an African-American in South Carolina, wonderful, wonderful Christian guy. And uh, we were talking about some of the racial stuff going on in America, and we got to talk about the Civil War. And I said the failure of the Christian church in America was the failure to take the book of Philippians seriously. And he goes, I don't think I understand, Don. I said, well, that's because Philemon is not a book that's commonly preached. I believe that to this day. It's not preached in the churches because if they did and if we believed it and if we practiced it, it would truly be revolutionary in modern-day America right now. Forget the Civil War. But you had two two groups of people, one justifying slavery, the other condemning it. But even the group condemning slavery in America, so far as the records that I've read, now I may be, I may not be literate enough on the, this history, and if anybody's aware of this, be, be sure to contact me. I would love to have the documentation for it. I don't believe that the church, the northern churches, appeal to Philemon nearly enough. Not nearly enough. What's Philemon all about? Paul writes to Philemon concerning his slave, Onesimus, who had run away. Paul's in prison. Onesimus, you know, Paul had converted Philemon. Onesimus, a slave, ran away. Now, look, in the first century, a slave that ran away, a Roman citizen whose slave ran away, 
could hire a a hitman. He could pay for the pitch to go ki- uh, go kill the slave, track him down, kill him, burn the body in pitch. That's all it cost him. No legal implications, no, no legal recriminations. It's his slave. He's a piece of meat. He'll go buy another slave. Big deal. That shows you the depravity of the Roman world. Okay. Okay. So Onesimus runs off to Rome to appeal to Paul. Paul, man, you got to help me out here, brother. You know, I'm a Christian too. So Paul writes this letter to Philemon a slave owner, for crying out loud, who as a Roman citizen understands his rights. He can have Onesimus beaten. He can sell him. He can have him quit, killed, and he has, he has no court of appeal. So Onesimus doesn't have anywhere to go, but he goes to Paul. Paul writes back to Philemon. Philemon, I'm writing this epistle to you not as a, an apostle, I'm not commanding you. I'm appealing to you as a brother whom you love. I'm appealing to you, and I'm sending Onesimus back with this letter, by the way. (laughs) And I want you, Philemon, to accept him back as a brother, not as a slave, as a brother. Huge. Oh, Huge. earth, earth shattering. I, when I, when I shared this and I spent more time with it in a phone call with my friend from South Carolina, I thought he was crying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course I could, I could see that bringing tears. Oh yeah. Yeah. He said, Don, I have never, ever, ever heard Philemon taught like that. I said, that's the tragedy. That That's the tragedy. You're right. 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 And some of that has to be because, once again, they're not really thinking about the absolute fact that this was a letter written in that timeline, in that context, a real person named Paul really sending a real person named Onesimus to a real person named Philemon that had those rights. Whereas when you realize, as I think I've heard you say it in a video, you're actually reading someone else's mail. Once you read it like that, you go... Oh, wait a minute. And then you can really find out what was beneath all of it. And then you can see the conversion today compared to, and by the way, I think you'd agree with me. And the last 10 years haven't been, let's say the best of the last 50 years. (laughs) You probably agree. It hasn't been the best, but still miles, miles and miles upon miles. um, I think we we would agree better than that, than that that type of position. We are exponentially... Billions and trillions of light years better than the Roman world. And the Roman world, let's face it, was exponentially better than some of the some of the empires that had gone before. They were expon- exponentially better than the Assyrian, the Nabataeans, and uh, a whole lot of the empires and the world's civilizations that, is, that had existed. Uh, the Greeks were somewhat okay, but still incredibly cruel, incredibly cruel. Uh, <clears throat> and so... What Christianity has done, wherever it has gone, it has elevated women, freed them from oppression. What it has done is in the areas most common, and even during even during the period of slavery, and this is I have to admit this is one of my pet peeves. I, I I'm I'm so horribly against the very idea of treating other human beings as less than human beings because of the color of their skin for crying out loud. But what what is so fascinating to me, it was actually some of the leading slave promoters, owners, purchasers, et cetera, et cetera, who finally goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not what the Bible's teaching. And they became anti-slave advocates. That, that's the power of the gospel when we start understanding the gospel. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I mentioned this in, in last week's uh, teaching. I was in Revelation 21 and I talked about um, there's a section in there how the, 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 the middle wall partition between Jew and Gentile is part of the truth of the gospel. This is one of those rare occasions, if you're really careful with the text, where, where Paul actually doesn't go through the process, the standard process. He 
in front of everyone says, hey, Peter, this is a dissimulation you got going on here because you don't want to eat in front of the special people over here. You don't want to <laughs> eat with the Gentiles. And he made a big show of that because he says, because he was not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. What was going on there? It, it, he was d dissenting from the idea that there's no more Jew, there's no more Gentile. That middle wall has been torn down. People have really reduced the good news they really have in Christianity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good news in the good news. You know, there's Absolutely. a lot of good news, more so than just simply, and don't get me wrong, certainly, 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 Jesus Christ indeed died for our sins, right? And the hope of resurrection. That's great news. Absolutely. But it's not the end of the that's not the end of the good news. It's not the end no. of it. So no, let me it's... let me um let me let me move you to this section because I yes. know some people are going to wonder about this. Because in First Corinthians 15 it says, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And then a little bit later on, it says, um, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, which would be the Father, that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. Right? So, uh, obviously, if we take the position that that's fulfilled, how? so some people might say, well, then, so, so how are we going to reconcile, for example, that, you know, everything's been put under under Christ's feet already, and he already delivered the kingdom to God, right? Because then people are going to see this like, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Is it God's will that this earth has these imperfections, if you will, or at least what what we call imperfections, right? Mm -hmm. is, is that is that what, what would be your response in the sense of reconciling that? Because best as I could tell, the main, I will even go as far as the only scriptural argument that's not actually scripturally argument. <laughs> it's not a scriptural argument. Is to say, come on, Shade. Come on, Preston. What's the matter <laughs> with you guys? How can all things be put under Jesus' feet? How could he have possibly delivered the kingdom to God? How could this possibly be God's will? I mean, you know, look at all these horrible things that happen, you know, uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, the awesome fridge that I have that, you know, has a has a dinner waiting for me at midnight. But anyways, <laughs> let's let's not talk about that. Let's look all about, you know, so what what do we say in reconciliation? Because it's a fair question. It is although, a very, very yes, it's a very yeah. fair question. So let's begin by noting what Paul says, then comes the end. So the the basic assumption is, oh, well, that's the end of time. Well, let's see right. if it is or not. Paul said that the resurrection, when mortals shall put on immortality, when the corruptible shall put on incorruptibility, then shall be brought to pass the saying, O death, where is your victory? He is quoting from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. In other words, he's anticipating the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. Then he says <clears throat> that that resurrection that he was anticipating when he says then comes the end would be the time when the law that was the strength of the sin would be overcome. And he says the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin. Now, let me put it like John Calvin did. I did not know John Calvin said this until I was writing a book. Uh, <clears throat> it has turned out to be one of my best-selling books entitled The Death of Adam, The Life of Christ. Pardon me. It's available on my website, donkpreston.com, or on Amazon, on Kindle. Okay. But John Calvin said, what Paul is saying here is when you deal with sin, you've dealt with death. And you know what? That's precisely how I put it in my book. Without knowing, right. I, I found the quote after I published the book. <laughs> That's the way it goes a lot of times. You find yeah. really, really good stuff uh, <laughs> after you publish. So here is, again, John Calvin was saying, now believe you me, John Calvin was still looking for physical resurrection, but he saw the power of the text of 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six, and he said, when you deal with sin, you've dealt with death. Okay. Amen and hallelujah. <clears throat> now, the next question becomes, and I want to do this as thoroughly as we can in the time allotted here. The end that Paul was looking for was the end of the law that was the strength of sin. Well, what law was the strength of sin? It was the old covenant. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, <clears throat> pardon me, beginning with about verse 6 and 7, I was alive once without the law, the law. 
uses the same identical term. I was alive once without the law. The commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now, I think we would both agree, and I think probably anyone who's going to view this blog would agree that Paul's not saying, you know what, I was physically alive one time, but the commandment came, sin revived, and I died physically. I don't think Paul's talking about his past physical death. No. But he is talking about the same death that Adam experienced. God said to Adam, in the day you eat the forbidden fruit, you will surely die. He didn't say you're going to begin to die. He didn't say you're going to become mortal. He didn't say you'll die 900 years later. In the day you eat, you will surely die. He ate the fruit. What happened on that day? He was alienated from God. Just like Paul, the day he sinned, he was alienated from God. So it's so, based on a covenant. But that's where we get the term. It's a covenantal death exactly. as opposed to a physical death. And in breaking of the covenant, it's, um, uh, like you said, a distancing, if you will, maybe um, a separation. Alienation from God. Alienation. Perfect word. Good. Continue. Exactly. And, and see, when, when we view the scriptures through this prism that Paul is presenting for us, we can better understand Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I mean, this is right after chapter 5, where he talks about, as in Adam, all men die. Well, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 22. But when he says, wherefore, as one by, by one man, sin entered in the world, and death through sin, therefore pa- death passed upon all men because all, because all men sinned. Okay, that's the context. What kind of death did Adam die? Alienation from God, kicked out of the presence of God. Now in chapter 6, as he's continued the discussion, he's not changing his subject. And I go through all this in this book that I mentioned, The Death of Adam, The Life of Christ. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now, Shay, this is where it gets really fun to me. And I was in a conversation with someone just recently who was insisting that it's all about biological death. And I said, well... Do you believe that Jesus died substitutionary death? Well, of course I do. Everybody believes that. So do you believe that Jesus' physical death was a substitutionary death? Well, of course I do. I said, okay, what does substitution mean? Uh, In place of. That's what it means, right? In the place of. Instead of. So as I asked this individual, I said, so you're telling me that Jesus' physical death was substitutionary. That's, That's right. Okay. If... If I, through faith, am in Christ and therefore am am under the power of his death. After all, Paul said in Romans chapter 6, as he's talking about death and life, do you not know that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death? Death. Okay. So if by being baptized, we are baptized into the power of Christ's death, then guess what? I shouldn't die. Nobody should for the last 2,000 years. Nobody that has ever believed in Jesus Christ, been baptized into Christ, no one should die physically. Because after no. all, wages of sin is death. Jesus died so that we don't have to die if we're in him. Why do Christians still die? I asked, I asked this individual that. They didn't have an answer for it. And it's really interesting. Oscar Kuhlman, who is a highly, highly respected, world-renowned biblical scholar, talking about the atonement, talking about redemption, talking about Christ's substitutionary death, he saw the train coming. And so he posed the question to his readers in, in, in his book. He said, the question is rightly asked, if Christ died a substitutionary death, then why is it that Christians must still die? Right. You know what his answer was? Well, <clears throat> as Christians, we still die to demonstrate that we're sanctified and redeemed. When I read that, I was like, (laughs) excuse me. (laughs) Okay. If I am in Adam and I sin, I have, I received the wages of sin, the penalty of sin, which is death. But now I'm redeemed by the blood of Christ. I've entered into Christ by being baptized into that substitutionary death but I've still got to die to show everybody that I'm redeemed from the death of Adam. <laughs> That's a good, wow. I, I call this. I love this. 
an argumentum ad desperatum. Yes, I love it when you say that. <laughs> I love it when you say that. It's great. <laughs> ad desperatum. I love it. Well, so it sounds so, you know, European. <laughs> yeah, well, Latin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, again, so so this is, again, where we talk about, okay, look, guys, what is wrong? Because even Paul says, prove all things, right? So what death are we talking about? Because that is so, so important to understanding what Jesus accomplished. If you make it about Adam's physical death, well, then... We're going to have to ask this question, then how did Jesus die on the cross? And that didn't stop anybody from physically dying. In fact, didn't stop Paul from dying, didn't stop Peter. What, were they the saints? I mean, if anybody should have made it, I'm pretty sure Peter, Paul, John, James, you know, pretty sure they should have been in the group. So clearly it was not that. And not to mention the fact that Jesus says, though he dies, he shall live. Well, wait a minute. That makes absolutely no sense if you turn the... He shall live into, right? And the, if you don't understand that, that though he dies is though he's going to physically die, yet he shall live, right? He shall not see death. That death that Adam experienced was not the physical death. And then that opens up all kinds of awesome conversations. And again, exciting because you can go back to Genesis and start going, well, wait a minute. He created everything from the beginning to have its own seed. And for people to multiply, if there was no physical death of things, because that's kind of how people picture it, eh? right? Like it's going to be a tree and that tree is never going to die, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. how they, it's like, <clears throat> well, if that's true, then why did he create everything with seed? Why, why did he do that? It is clear to me. And then he says at the end of that, he says, and he saw everything and that it was very good. That has to include the positioning that things were not going to, um, you know, be infinite, but rather have a certain timeline and then go back to the ground, have a certain timeline. That would be true of plants, of animals. And indeed, best as I can tell, he created human beings uh, to multiply as well. Let me let me point something out to Please. you. Let me tell you a little anecdote. In 2016, I had uh, I had a formal public debate with a professor from Faulkner University in Montgomery, Alabama. In written questions, I asked him, is physical death the enemy of the child of God? Now, folks, I think that's a real, real, real serious question. Okay? Very serious. And he wrote back. Now, and I, I want to point out a little bit of a backstory here. A growing number of really academic guys, I'm talking major world-class scholars, are now saying N.T. Wright is one of them. Physical death was never the problem. Sin was the problem. Physical death existed before sin they are saying. So this uh, Dr. David Hester answered and said, no, physical death is not the enemy of the child of God. Physical de uh, death existed as a part of the natural created order. When I read his, when I read his written answer, I was like, holy cow, he just gave away the farm, the dog, the cat, the gerbil, the goldfish, you know. <laughs> and the fence too, the fence too. And the fence. I mean, he yeah. gave away everything. So during the debate, I had a bunch of charts, and I said, I asked David the following question. He said, no, physical death was a part of the natural created order and existed before sin. Since death existed before sin, then it was part of the created order concerning which God said he saw everything that he had created and said it was good. And so therefore... Therefore, it's not the curse that is talked about in Revelation 21, exactly. because I believe it's Galatians that makes it very clear. Paul says the curse was the law. Absolutely. So when it says that there's no more curse, it means there's no more old covenant because we're now in the new heaven and new earth, which is a new covenant. Absolutely. The curse is not physical death, right? Well, I've, because, I've got, I've got to tell you that David Hester never breathed on an answer. Never attempted even once. And I made, I made the same argument two or three times during the debate. And I challenged him. You've made a statement here that demands that physical death is not the curse. If, if physical death was not the curse, then why do I have to have a physical body coming out of the grave to overcome physical death, which was never the problem? He wouldn't answer it. Refused absolutely to answer it. Not to mention so, the fact now, that it says flesh and blood. Oh, no, cool. I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. You're on. yeah so go, anyway, go. so that's the end that we're talking about. It is the end of the spiritual alienation, the end of the old covenant. If 
violation of which brought alienation from God. So that puts this situation that Paul is describing in in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 within its proper covenantal context. Now, then comes in when he, when he shall deliver the kingdom to the Father. One of the misgivings, I think, misunderstandings of the text is to think that that means Christ would surrender the kingdom right. to the Father. Right. Well, That's not, yeah, no. The Greek word deliver there is paradidomai, and it does not mean surrender. It means share. And we find this, by the way, manifested and defined for us in Revelation chapter 22 and 3, which, in which after the great white throne judgment of chapter 20, after the coming of the new creation, what do we find? We have the Father and the Son on the Father's throne, sharing the one throne. That's what is meant by God is all in all. There is no echelon, so to speak, although always because of, I, I will use the term, because of the hierarchy, you have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? Does it mean inferiority by any stretch of the imagination? But the point being, and I will appeal to Zechariah chapter 14 here, First Corinthians 15, then shall God be all in all. Zechariah 14 predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, the creation of a new Jerusalem, living waters flowing out from the new Jerusalem to give life to the nations. Well, that's Revelation 21 and 22, obviously. And in that day, what? There shall be one Lord over all. That's 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 28. God shall be all in all. Okay? Christ would subsume himself, if I may use that term, probably too long or too strong of a word, but he would then be joining with the Father. He delivered the Father, the kingdom to the Father. Now, I've got a friend who suggests that that deliverance of the kingdom was the deliverance of the old covenant kingdom to the Father for judgment. It's a very attractive idea. I have to think about it. I, I told my friend, I said, I, I'm going to have to work through that. That's a, that's a really, really powerful suggestion, and so I'm going to have to look at it. But it says, when he has put all things under his feet. So everybody looks around and they say, oh, look, look, I still see sin. I still see uh, death. I still see, you know, injustice, corruption. We look at politicians today and there doesn't seem to be an honest one in the whole mix, wherever it might be, Canada, America, whatever. It's just a mess. So <clears throat> that's what people appeal to, appeal to. Let me make an observation here. Paul is very emphatic. He has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is accepted that the one who put all things under his feet is not put under him. But everything else had except the last enemy. Which was death. Which was death. So let me ask you, I, I, I've posed this question in formal public debates over and over and over again. When Paul says all things had already been put under him, wouldn't that include murder, violence, injustice? Has he not put all those things under him? It says he has put all things under him. Colossians 2 and verse 14, Paul said, in the cross, Christ triumphed over the principalities and the powers, making a public shame of them, a public openly. spectrum openly. Yeah. So, yeah, he put them under his feet. Now, the word that is used there is hupatazo when, he, when it says put all things under him. And it means subjected to literally put one, put under one. So Christ, according to Paul, had already conquered all of those things. The only thing left to conquer was death. So I ask people to contemplate this. Since Paul emphatically declares that everything had already been put under him, then maybe our concept of what it meant for Paul when he said all things are put under him, maybe we're not understanding what Paul meant. Maybe right. we're thinking, oh, well, take it out of existence. 
Right. And instead of meaning Christ has conquered it so that it no more has power over us. Right. Because right now I have a carpet underneath my feet, but it's still there. Exactly. And it serves a purpose to me and it, and it, and it's right. It's kind of, I, I can move this carpet if I want to, <laughs> for example, yeah. right. You know, but it doesn't mean it's of non-existence. So they're kind of taking under his feet, kind of like, and I dare I say it, even Romans uh, chapter 16, 20 says he will, he will bruise Satan under your feet shortly, a time statement there, by the way. Mm-hmm. But does that even mean completely annihilated, depending what, how people view Satan. And allow me to offer you this since you brought in the part about death, because the, uh, and just to share a bit, one of the biggest ones that really kind of, aside from the time statements, I think that was the biggest one uh, that, you know, this generation and things of this nature really kind of started blowing up in my mind to go, wait a minute here. You know, if, if he was talking about the destruction of the temple, you know, uh, you know, because there's not a lot of talk in the Sunday buildings, because that's what I call them. Sorry. I call, you know, in the Orthodox box, <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> they don't talk a lot about, they really don't train Christians about the Roman Jewish war. No, they don't, they, they don't encourage the book of Josephus. They don't encourage the book of Tacitus or any of that. And, but I, I remember reading too, when I was kind of struggling going, Oh, what's going on? Have I lost my mind here? Uh, I got to first, uh, or excuse me, set, Excuse me, 2 Timothy, verse 10. Uh, but I'll, I'll grab 9, and you'll be familiar with the verse, of course. Verses it says, um, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, but according to our works, excuse me, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, That sounds very present tense like there, by the way. And Mm -hmm. then he says, who hath, that sounds past tense, unless there's some kind of grammatical error in the King James. So second errorist. Okay, so it's it's proper. Past tense. Who hath abolished death. So let me make this observation. Please, please. The word abolished there is katargeo, the very same word that he uses in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be destroyed. So it's the kind of nullified, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it means. So yeah. he and and then Katar- that, I, let me interrupt here. Katargeo can mean one of two things: uh, it can mean to nullify, to break the power of, or it can mean to annihilate, to simply take out of existence. Context alone determines. Which many, many words in English do the same thing, right? Oh, I, I try, you know, I, I try to keep things very, you know, simple for my sake, but I'll, I'll use like really, really simple statements like, you know, I can go get a can of tomatoes. <laughs> the, the two cans spelt identically sound identical in the same sentence, just a few words apart mean two totally different things. Now, Correct. in this case, it's not even that different, the, you know, depending on the context. And I would suggest, by the way, I think the word forever has that same kind of thing that people think when you read the Bible, forever means infinity, right? Well, that can't be true because the old covenant had a promise of a new covenant and he said forever all the time. So (laughs) I think when you start study I own, I think if I'm pronouncing that properly, it means for, you know, depending on the context. I mean, the forever was used in uh, Jonah uh, chapter two, verse six. It was for three days and three nights. I say yep. forever all the time. If they keep me on hold for four hours on the phone, yeah. I'm like, man, they got me here <laughs> forever. It's like, so again, context determines how you'll use it. So um, it, it appears to me, I could argue based on second Timothy verse 10, verse nine and 10, that that death, that Jesus, excuse me, that Paul or Jesus through Paul was saying, there's only one more enemy left and that's death. I could argue by the time second Timothy rolled around, that problem got taken care of. I could potentially argue that it could be, you know, it could be, you know, coming, but not yet. It could be, but I he think doesn't it's seem already, to... but not yet. I think it's a, pro- it could be a case of prolepsis. A, pro- a case of prolepsis is when you speak of something having been accomplished because it, the certainty of it is beyond dispute. Right. Like I've got and, the, and, uh, the the dinner's in the oven. Uh, so exactly. dinner's happening. Exactly. It's happening. But exactly. it's not it's not already, but not yet for thousands of years. <laughs> right, exactly. Like yeah. dinner's yeah, still you're, in the you're oven. You're not and, talking about something that's going to be protracted out for two millennia. Uh, listen, as hey, we discussed. Uh, absolutely. Out of yeah. time. Hey, hey I've this enjoyed this a whole lot. 
I appreciate and I'm honored by the invitation. So thank you very much. And and I was honored that you accepted this invitation, uh, you know, Don. And I just great greatly appreciate you so much and uh, and all your work. And as I mentioned, everybody, I'm going to you know put the links. Uh, and of course, you can look up uh, Don Preston, Don K Preston. Uh, he's on YouTube. He's on Now TV as well. I think um, actually, I'm, hopefully, I'm going to try to find you on Facebook as well. Um, and I just if if anything else, you know, we don't slam our fists around here saying thus saith the Lord constantly but we what i do believe is that good solid sound hermeneutics and mr preston here my good friend and brother is doing a very very good job at, at using lots and lots of scripture as well as greek and hebrew and has done a lot of studies here and i think that my if, if i might you know come commit a little time to this is to say look Here's the interpretation. Check it out. Consider it with an open mind, Amen. and uh, and just you know do, do that. I think you'll um, greatly, greatly um, you, you'll be thankful that you did. And so again, Mr. Don Preston, my good brother and friend, thank you. Hopefully, maybe we can do another one of these. Be glad um, to. Know, we'll, be glad we'll, uh, to. We'll talk about that, and maybe we can even get Mike Michael Sullivan around. And maybe hey, there you go. We, maybe get you know, maybe get <laughs> get William. Yeah. We can get William out or something. Well, yes. and have a big a big hoopla. There you go. All, All right. right. Good night. God bless you, brother. See you soon.